You good? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Michel Duchard, and I'm the chair of the Canadian Studies Program here at UBC. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2019 Maclean Lecture Series entitled Cold, Dark, and Dangerous, the Arctic and Outer Space at Green College. Our lecture tonight uh, is being held on the UBC Point Grey campus, which sits on the traditional, ancestral, uh, unceded territory of the Musqueam First Nation. Uh, the Maclean the Lecture Series has been made possible by the generosity of Monsieur and Madame David and Breda McLean, who I would like to thank publicly. <laughs> I would also like to thank Professor Mark Vesey, Principal of Green College, who has generously accepted to host the McLean Lecture Series once again this year, uh, and who will also be hosting a reception after uh, the talk tonight. Professor Vesey, thank you. My thanks also go to Tanya Astorino and Alan Gumbach from Green College, who had made my life extremely easy at organizing this because they did pretty much everything. So thank you to both of them. And of, and of course, thank you to all of you who have defied, confronted the Arctic weather, well, as far as Arctic goes in Vancouver, I guess, uh, to be uh, here tonight to attend this lecture. Uh, tonight's lecture is entitled Our 3D Arctic, and it will be delivered by Professor Michael Byers, the Canada 2017-19 Brenda and David McLean Chair in Canadian Studies. Professor Byers does not really need an introduction from me, but I will introduce him anyway. Uh, he is a professor in the uh, Political Science Department, where he holds a Canada Research Chair in Global Politics and International Law. His work focuses on outer space, the Arctic, the Arctic uh, Canadian foreign policy, the climate change, the laws of wars. He has published seven books. Uh, uh, his most recent one, International Law and the Arctic, published by Cambridge University Press, uh, won the 2013 Donor Prize. He has, uh, also, he has been also a fellow at Jesus College, Cambridge University, Professor at, of Law at Duke University and a visiting professor uh, at the University of Cape Town, Tel Aviv, Nord in Norway, and Novosibirsk in Russia. Lastly, Professor Byers is also a regular contributor to the Globe and Mail newspaper. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Byers. Merci beaucoup, Michel. Um, I, I'm showing this photograph of um, my family's driveway on Salt Spring Island because the lecture you're going to hear today um, was thought through yesterday when I was shoveling that very long driveway. Um, we received over 50 centimeters of snow on Salt Spring Island. Um, and given that this lecture is uh, about uh, the Arctic uh, and it's a Canadian studies lecture, I, I think the um, combination is, is, is quite, uh, quite timely, almost profound. Uh, so here I am, a Canadian, giving a lecture about Canadian studies with very sore arms and shoulders as a result of a quintessentially Canadian activity, shoveling snow. Um, and uh, I will now move to the, the lecture itself. Uh, but one last proviso. Uh, that um, young man you see uh, standing there actually moving away from us in the photograph uh, is my elder son, Cameron. Uh, and he will appear in the lecture. Um, so, so that's your glimpse of him. Okay, our 3D Arctic. This lecture is, is actually um, an exercise in interdisciplinary exploration on my part. 
I'm both an international lawyer and a political scientist, but I'm actually venturing into political geography. Um, and I'll explain why um, by starting with a map. This is a pretty standard, boring map of the world. Um, a couple of things to, to be said about it. Uh, it it's flat. It, uh, it's a standard Mercator projection, which is distorted. Um, and it's incredibly Eurocentric. Um, and it's missing some important parts, um, like the Antarctic, which is not there. Uh, an entire continent is not on this map. Um, but also significant land masses in the Arctic are cut off. Uh, the northern uh, half of Ellesmere Island is cut off. That's an island larger than the United Kingdom, belongs to Canada. Uh, the northernmost part of Greenland is cut off. That's the largest island in the world that is not a continent in its own right. Um, Svalbard is, is missing. Franz Josef line, uh, Land is, is not there. Um, I mean, there's some big problems with, with this map. Um, at, most obviously, it, it, it's, it's a flat map um, that, that has inaccurate proportions, is incomplete, and in no way represents where we really are, which is on a sphere in space. Hmm. Let's try for a better map, or at least a map that shows this country. Uh, and this is a better map for, for one significant reason, and that is that it's topographic. Right? There's a little bit of 3D in this map. Uh, so you, you can actually see uh, the mountains, uh, not only uh, on the west coast of this country, but, but also in the Arctic. Uh, some very significant uh, mountains on Baffin Island and, and Ellesmere Island. Um, Baffin Island is the location of Thor, which is the highest vertical face in the world, over 5,000 feet, truly spectacular. Um, it's ours, if you're Canadian. Um, although very few people in this country or, or from elsewhere will ever see that mountain. Um, but there, there are problems with this map also, big problems. Um, at least there are words showing where the United States of America is, including uh, Alaska. And, and there's a little St. Pierre Nicolon over here, which is nice because that's another neighbor of ours. Um, the largest island in the world that is not a continent is, is missing. <laughs> Greenland's not there, even though it's only 20 nautical miles away from Canada. Um, so that's uh, curious. Um, th there, there's a, a problem in, I think, the color coding that's used for, for the map, um, because the north is, is, is very green, and, and that's true for a couple of months each summer. Um, but the Arctic is normally not green. It's normally white. And, and then, of course, that's not the Arctic Ocean up at the top. That's the Beaufort Sea. The Arctic Ocean is actually north of the Queen Elizabeth Islands. It's just not there. Um, and of course, the map's also problematic in that it's, well, it's, it's, it's arbitrarily centered on, I guess, Hudson Bay. Um, so let's try for something else that's maybe a little bit more interesting, at least in terms of thinking about the Arctic, which is what I'm interested in right now. Let's try this. There was a paradigm shift that occurred in Arctic studies uh, just a little over a decade ago when, when people started moving from flat maps that were centered on the equator to, to maps that were centered on the North Pole. Now, this was an important psychological moment. It was prompted by a Russian scientist and politician named Artur Chilongarov, who planted a titanium Russian flag on the seabed 
at the geographic North Pole. Uh, did so in the full glare of um, television cameras and lights because um, he is first and foremost a Russian politician, the deputy chair of the Russian Duma at the time, um, and declared that the Arctic is Russian. And all of a sudden the world became interested in the Arctic and the North Pole, and it's pretty hard to actually talk about the North Pole if you're looking at a map that doesn't include the Arctic Ocean. Um, and so maps like this uh, appeared. Um, some of them, of course, pre-existed 2007, but, but their use uh, increased dramatically. Uh, and so what can I say about this map? Um, any projection on Earth is valid. Again, we're a sphere in space. So you could have a map that was centered on the South Pole. You could have a map that, that was centered on, I don't know, uh, Burundi. It would be just as valid as, as any map, including this map. Um, but this does uh, show us a couple of, of things. Um, first of all, um, it, it shows the different Arctic countries um, around the ocean at the center of this region. The, the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by continents, and therefore the opposite of the Antarctic, which is a continent surrounded by oceans. Um, it, it, it shows, and, and the reason I, I chose this map is because it's, it's from the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, and therefore I can say without um, a, a, a being critical or, or making fun of our uh, large neighbor to the south to say that the, the size of the fonts used reflect the relative importance of these countries in the Arctic. Uh, Canada is an important Arctic country. Um, we, in fact, have the longest coastline in the world because of our 19,000 Arctic islands, but, but Russia uh, is very much um, a major Arctic country also. Look at all of that coastline. Look at all of those time zones. Um, so you have this uh, relationship in play. We are neighbors with Russia, separated by two very large backyards in terms of, of the Arctic Ocean, uh, and as we'll see in terms of our maritime zones. Um, but it's, it's still inadequate for all kinds of reasons because, among other things, it's, it's a, a flat map and, and oceans are, are not flat. Oceans have depth. And then, of course, there's also airspace. We are not glued to the surface of this planet. We regularly escape into the air above it thanks to the technology of aircraft. But a map like this, a, a flat map that's centered on the Arctic Ocean, does enable us to do certain things that, that are particularly useful. One of them is to show the utility of future Arctic shipping routes. This is not a, a perfectly centered map. It's, it's tilted a little bit. Um, so in that sense, I guess it's Eurocentric. Um, but uh, it shows future Arctic shipping routes. Actually, two of them uh, are already used, one being the Northern Sea Route along the coast of Russia, um, which knocks 30% off of the shipping distance between South Korea and Western Europe. Um, and the Northern, uh, sorry, the Northwest Passage on the other side, which knocks uh, roughly an equivalent percentage off of uh, shipping between uh, the North uh, eastern coast of Asia and uh, the Atlantic seaboard of the United States. So a map like this enables you to see the shortcuts that are potentially available in the Arctic, potentially because they're dependent on the continued melting of, of sea ice. Ah, sea ice. These maps haven't shown sea ice. Um, and then the, the future Central Arctic shipping route there is, uh, is very much um, a, a future scenario dependent upon our continued um, uh, production of greenhouse gas emissions um, and a continuation of, of the, the ongoing rapid melting of, of Arctic sea ice, uh, at least uh, during the summer months, though not in the winter, 
I'll get to that. A map that's centered on the Arctic Ocean on the North Pole is also useful in terms of showing maritime zones. Um, this is a, a map uh, produced by the International Boundary Research Unit at Durham University in the UK. Uh, it's periodically updated. Um, this, I believe, is about a 2014 version. Um, and it, it portrays in a visual manner things that international lawyers like to spend lots and lots of time, lots and lots of time deciphering and debating. Um, without going into any detail, um, let me just say that uh, the, 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 the blue, the darker blue areas are um, internal waters at least as claimed by the countries um, alongside which those blue areas uh, are located. Um, Canada claims that the Arctic Archipelago is Canadian internal waters within straight baselines, so that's the color you get there. And you see also that uh, Russia um, claims internal waters in the Vilchilsky Straits, um, which is why Canada and Russia have the exact same legal position with regards to those two coastal waterways in respect of disputes they both have with the United States. The, um, the uh, darker of these um, areas along the coastlines in the different colors, the darker shades um, uh, of, of green and pink and orange and, and yellow are exclusive economic zones. Um, which every country has um, after the conclusion of the 1982 Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, extending outwards um, from uh, their baselines from essentially the, the low water mark. Uh, and, and as you'll see here, and a map shows this very nicely, this map shows it very nicely, all of that yellow, all of that yellow along the coast of Russia is undisputably Russian, exclusive economic zone, right? Russia doesn't need more Arctic. Some of you will have read a story by Bob Weber in the newspapers in the last couple of days about how Russia is beefing up its Arctic capabilities. Well, it's not because Russia has any intent of conquering any additional Arctic territories. Russia has got centuries <laughs> of work to do simply exploring and exploiting its own exclusive economic zone. There, there's no need for a country with that size of continental shelf, of water column, of fisheries to, to feel any need to encroach elsewhere. This map shows that. It shows it very well. Um, and, and Canada, too, has an extensive uh, exclusive economic zone. So does the United States. Um, north of Alaska. Uh, the U.S. has been exploring for oil there um, in the last decade or so, totally legitimate. Um, Greenland, which uh, belongs to, to Denmark, um, also has extensive uh, exclusive economic zones. Svalbard's interesting because of a treaty uh, dating from 1919, uh, the Spitsbergen Treaty, um, but is a place of, of Norwegian sovereignty. It's all... Um, made more visible. The only maritime boundary dispute that actually is big enough to show up on this map is that little yellowish wedge in the Beaufort Sea north of Alaska and Canada. The only one that's significant enough to show up on the map. The only other one is between Canada and Greenland, and it's too tiny to, to be here. The um, hashed areas in the middle uh, are areas that uh, the different coastal states um, have sovereign rights over as extended continental shelves, existing sovereign rights. And all of them, with the exception of the United States, are um, making submissions to a commission on the limits of the continental shelf. Uh, these submissions are based upon science. They're all 
working with the system. And the United States, although it's not part of the system because it has not ratified the law of the sea convention, actually supports the system and is doing its own science with the intent of making a similar, not a submission, but a similar claim in what's called customary international law. And again, this map shows that, that nicely. Um, so this kind of map, a flat map with the North Pole at the middle, enables an international lawyer to actually explain this in less than five hours. Right in the middle, there's a little blue dot. But of course, that's just the geographic North Pole. That's not the magnetic North Pole. There, there are different poles. The, the magnetic North Pole is moving as we speak. Um, but uh, the North Pole is not even right in the middle of this ocean. It's, um, the ocean did not arrange itself around the North Pole. Um, the, the North Pole is one end of the axis of this planet, which of course is spinning in space. Oh, and just to make a, a, a space connection here, it, it's the tilt of that axis as our planet does its yearly voyage around the sun that causes the seasons, which is what causes the Arctic climate, which is what makes the Arctic what it is the total darkness of winter in the Arctic and the midnight sun of the summertime is the result of that tilt of our planet relative to our star. Hmm. Sorry, I was uh, jumping ahead to space a little bit, but just to make the point that the, the North Pole only has relevance if you think about the planet as a sphere in space. So. Now's my chance to pick on political geographers. Um, political geographers um, are not very good at verticality. Um, they're good at, at 2D. They, they've only started thinking seriously about 3D in the last uh, decade or two. Um, and some of them now think seriously about verticality. Um, our own Derek Gregory here at UBC uh, has done some interesting work on, on airspace um, and, and particularly uh, drones. Um, Stuart Eldon at uh, Warwick University uh, has done some really interesting work in terms of, um, of, of urban geography and the geography, for instance, of, of uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Um, Philip Steinberg at Durham University has worked a little bit on oceans. Um, but this gives you an example of just how, how limited this subdiscipline of geography has actually been. So the 2010 article in a leading journal in political geography, named Political Geography, um, and it's a 2D map. And the best that the author can do, I, I don't know him, but the best he can do in terms of showing uh, submarine features is to write their names across the 2D map. You see, the, the Arctic Ocean has got ridges. And these ridges are legally relevant because they can, depending on the bathymetry, bathymetry and the, the geomorphology of the ridges, constitute part of extended continental shelves to be part of those hash marks on the previous map. So they matter in terms of political geography. But a 2D map where you just write the name uh, is a reflection of how inadequate the page is as a depiction of 3D. Well, the oceanographers are ahead of the political geographers. This is the bathymetric map of the Arctic, which is the result of a decade and a half of collaboration among oceanographers from different countries, mostly Arctic countries, um, now, the, the data that's used is, is not particularly precise, but given the scale of the map, that's not so important. Um, the Arctic Ocean is thousands of kilometers across. So these are the big features. And you can see the ridges. Right? You can see the Lomonosov Ridge uh, along the middle, passing near but not quite at, at the North Pole. You can see the Alpha Ridge, which is much more dispersed. Um, the, these ridges are 
are an important uh, feature here that, that, that when actually projected in this way, depicted in this way, all of a sudden take on meaning. Right? A picture is worth a thousand words. You can see the Arctic Ocean. You can see, look at that, those amazingly broad continental shelves along the coast of Russia. Russia is the largest producer of oil and gas in the world. Well, that, that's part of the reason why it's going to continue to be the largest producer of oil and gas in the world. Um, Norway, uh, which is a significant oil producer, is starting to, to drill uh, between mainland Norway and Svalbard. You see that shelf there. Um, you see the Chechai Plateau, just, uh, I guess, north but down from the Bering Strait. Um, which uh, the Americans are very interested in, uh, and which Shell was uh, interested in just a couple of years ago. Um, and, and this map is, is therefore a much better depiction of, of depth. But there are a few things that are missing. Notice that it shows ice on land. It shows the glaciers. It shows the Greenland ice cap. But it doesn't show ice on the water. Well, I guess you wouldn't be able to see the bathymetry, the underwater topography, if the ice were there. Um, but it's curious. You show ice on land, but, but not on the surface of the ocean. So the map is instantly compromised. <laughs> By, um, by the selection of some ice, but not others. The, the other thing about this is that, although it shows the ocean depths, it doesn't attempt to show what's above the surface of the ocean. And, and how do you map airspace? Well, you could put the polar routes that Russia introduced in 1996 into the map and draw a line showing the new arteries for international air travel that now exist across the Arctic. Right? There is a literally a highway that crosses over Greenland. Anyone here flown from Vancouver to Europe? Yeah? You flew over Greenland. Where's that highway? There's a highway in the sky. Right? There's like a plane every five minutes going over Greenland. You can map that. Right? Just like you map the shipping routes. There are all kinds of possibilities here, and I'm not even getting yet to space. But space is a crucial part of this picture, too. Most of the world's Earth imaging remote sensing satellites are in polar orbits. They pass over the Arctic. Because if you're in a sun-synchronous polar orbit, you pass over the same locations on the Earth's surface, surface at the same time each day. So you can do perfect comparisons from day to day from space of your images, whether optical or, or radar. So the, the vast majority of the world's Earth imaging satellites, which are crucial to just about Everything you could imagine, from fishing to farming to agriculture to military um, to science, climate change science without Earth imaging would be very difficult to do. That's all part of space. Communications is all part of space. It's not there. So, so how, but this actually is the problem, right? How do you take a page? and make a 3D map, 3D map that includes the ocean, and includes space, and includes the topography of the land. How do you actually produce a 2D flat map of the real Arctic? I, I struggle with this, and, and, and I have you know, brilliant children who can do things with computers, who could do a 3D map on their computer, but it would still look strange on a page. And then I stumbled upon the map that does this. And it's not what you would expect.
This is a, a piece of Inuit art. It's by Konojoak Ashavak, who passed away six years ago. Um, and I'm pleased to report that it belongs to every Canadian in the room because it's the property of the Governor of Canada. Um, and it was a very wise purchase because it's so extraordinary. So I mentioned that space gives the Arctic its seasons. And I mentioned that the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by continents. OK, well, there's the land all the way around the outside. See the land? See the mountains? Yeah? See the mountains. And then you've got the ocean. And, and, and look, there's summer. Summer is where there's open water. Right? You see the kayaks? The kayaks are in summertime. And the Inuit are living on land in tents because there's no snow for igloos. So they're hunting. They're hunting, if you look really closely, sorry about the resolution here, um, but they're actually hunting narwhal. And the polar bears are on shore because there's no sea ice in the summertime. So it's kayaking, it's hunting, it's living on the land because the Arctic is in 24 hours sunlight because of the tilt of the planet. And so it's soaking in the sun's rays. But, but then it's fall. And the ice starts to form, fast ice first along the coast, broken ice a little bit further out. The Inuit are still intense. There's not enough snow to build igloos. Right, um, but uh, the polar bears are out on the, 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 the fast ice, um, and and you can't really see it, um, but there's actually a, a, an anuk in a white parka, and he's feeding uh, one of his dogs. The dogs, of course, tr crucial transportation um, devices. I have spoken to Inuit elders who tell me of traveling 500 kilometers in a single day by dog sled across fast ice. Um, they're high technology people, uh, the Inuit. Um, and then you move into to, to winter. And then you see the igloos. Right? And you see a little bit of hunting of seals through the ice. You see the dogs. Um, but the dogs aren't pulling sleds. It's very, very cold. Everyone's in the igloos, except when they're out trying to catch a seal. Um, and, and you see some, some, some more wildlife. You see caribou. You see um, uh, a raven an arctic fox, uh, but we're moving into spring. It's getting a little bit warmer. Oh, that igloo, the top of the igloo is actually a tent now. It's not so cold, right? And the dog is, is happier, and the, oh, there's a sled, because that's when you really want to travel, is in the spring, when you have daylight and you still have ice, right? Travel, vast distances, go and visit your family on the other side of Baffin Bay in Greenland. Um, and, and then, of course, you get to, to to the late spring, the ice is breaking up. There's now a tent on the ice. And lots and lots of holes in the ice. And oh gosh, there's a little bit of ice fishing going on. The seasons, isn't that brilliant? Isn't it? It's the Arctic in its seasonal totality showing the Inuit through the different stages of their year uh, in relationship to their ecosystem, which is the maritime ecosystem. They are a maritime people who only live on land in the summertime. And, and, and at the center of it all is space. They get it. They've been navigating by the stars and the moon and the sun for millennia. They know the importance of, of space. Um, it's part of their culture, religion. It's at the center of their world. And it's the moon, and it's the sun, and it's the stars. This is the map that I kind of imagined that I would be getting someone to produce on a computer using some complicated 3D software. And then I, no, Kanot Joak Ashabak did it. 
1992. None of it, our land. That's the Inuit territory. Whew. I get really excited by this, right? And, 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 and this may be the greatest political geographer ever, because she figured it out. So today, today, we've got Inuit, Inuit children, in a very different technological era, relying on space. There are no cables going to none of it. This is all satellite-based communication. And, and they're, they're navigating the internet. And they're doing so just incidentally via a satellite in geostationary orbit that is 35,000 kilometers above the equator. So if you include geostationary orbit as part of the political geography of space, the Arctic is actually much deeper than it is broad. And what is geostationary orbit? Geostationary orbit is the place where if you put a satellite there, it remains locked above the same place on the equator at all times because the satellite is falling at exactly the same speed that the Earth is rotating. Absolutely crucial for uh, communications. And, and Canada's been in this for a long time. This is Alouette One. Way back in 1962, Canada became the third country in space after the Soviet Union, because 1957 was Sputnik, and then the United States it was Canada. Alouette One. And what was Alouette One designed to do? It was designed to do science on the ionosphere, which is part of the upper atmosphere. Because unless you understand the ionosphere, you cannot successfully do long-range radio communications. And that's where the government of Canada was, was at in the early 1960s, was how do we broadcast long distances across the second largest country on Earth with radio when this stupid ionosphere keeps messing things up. So up goes Alouette 1 on an American rocket, but a Canadian satellite, to study the ionosphere, to figure this out so Canada could broadcast across its vast geography. Well, <laughs> exactly, 10 years later, forget radio that's going Earth to Earth. Why don't we add a corner to the triangle and broadcast off of a satellite in geostationary orbit? The world's first non-military communication satellite. Canadian satellite, Anik A. Why? so that the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation could broadcast radio and television from coast to coast to coast. So Canada's a space-faring country, the third, because of the Arctic. Oh yes, and notice the 1970s attire. So where are we today? Well, this is Telestar 19 Vantage. It's a high throughput, th high throughput broadband internet satellite in geostationary orbit that has targeted transmissions to 25 communities in Nunavut. So those children have now got high speed broadband because of a satellite owned by a Canadian company, Telesat, based in Ottawa. This satellite was launched last June on top of a Falcon 9 rocket, Elon Musk and SpaceX, but it's Canadian. And again, specifically servicing the Arctic. Telesat is now one of three companies that is leading the race to put constellations of smaller communication satellites in low Earth orbit to provide 5G connectivity to the entire planet by putting hundreds, maybe even thousands, of smaller comm satellites just 
four or five or six hundred kilometers above your heads because then you don't have any latency. You can have a perfectly fluid conversation, which you cannot do from geostationary. Geostationary is just too far away for that back and forth instant communication. But again, um, this is uh, the Arctic. Every single one of those Inuit kids who I showed you will have relatives who go out on the land, out on the ice. In some of these Inuit communities, 80% of the food is sourced from wildlife. So they go out a lot, mostly now on snowmobiles, some of them still on dog sleds. They go out onto the land. And unlike Vancouver, which is not particularly cold, not particularly dark because of all the city lights, and, and certainly not dangerous environmentally to you or me, um, the Arctic is cold, dark, and dangerous. Insanely cold, dark, and dangerous. I personally have lost four colleagues in the last eight years to accidents in the Arctic. Lost as in dead, right? It's a dangerous place. And everyone who travels in the Arctic carries something like this. This is a handheld search and rescue beacon. The local RCMP detachment will have a dozen of them strung up on a nail inside their front door that Inuit hunters can sign out to take with them as they go on to the ice. It, it, it's brilliant because it takes the search out of search and rescue. These things transmit in an emergency. You just hit a button, turn them on, transmits up to a satellite. And they can actually pinpoint your location using the Doppler effect because the, the frequency changes as the satellite passes overhead and they know exactly where to go to rescue you. Amazing. These instruments cost $250 or $300 a piece. Anyone here do any serious backcountry activity? You should have one of these. They work here too. And the system works especially well because of international collaboration. Dating all the way back to 1979, it's called the COSPAS SARSAT program. Set up during the Cold War by the Soviet Union in partnership with Canada, France, and the United States. And it now uses dozens of satellites in low Earth orbit, in medium Earth orbit, in geostationary orbit. Um, you hit one of those beacons, it will be picked up by a satellite almost immediately because there will be a satellite overhead, some one satellite, Russian, French, American, Canadian. They'll pick up the beacon and the emergency call and the location will be transmitted to the nearest search and rescue dispatcher. And not just in those four countries, but anywhere in the world. For free. For, for $250, right? This was created at the height of the Cold War in 1979. It has saved many thousands of lives. Every year in Canada, it saves hundreds of lives. And almost no one knows about it. And it's especially important in the Arctic. Important to the people who get into trouble and need help, and important to the Canadian taxpayer who would otherwise be spending hundreds of millions of dollars each year on unnecessary search. We don't need to search. We know where they are. We just need to go and rescue them. I've already mentioned Earth observation satellites, remote sensing. This is the world's largest commercial um, ground station. Uh, for satellites. Uh, it's in the Norwegian high arctic on Svalbard, uh, on top of a mountain. I've, I've been there. It's, it's truly spectacular. Um, and uh, this is all connected to mainland, mainland Norway by a fiber optic cable that was paid for by NASA, the American Space Agency, which was one of the largest customers of KSAT, which is the Norwegian company that provides this, this downloading capability. And again, it's here because all those Earth imaging satellites in polar orbit converge over the pole. So this is the best place to pick up signals from all of those satellites as they pass overhead. Um, and, and I remember being in one of these domes uh, roughly a year ago. And it happened to be a dome that, a, a dish inside the dome, because a big satellite, the, the domes are just there to keep the snow off the dishes. Um, and, and, and so there's this big dish, and it's all automated. And it was actually downloading from European Space Agency Sentinel satellites. That was the job of this one dish. These are climate science satellites. Right? They cost about half a billion dollars each. 
uh, and they do amazing um, imaging using um, optical uh, and now some radar uh, technologies. And this dish would, would capture a, a satellite and the dish would move as the satellite moved across the sky, across the North Pole. And after 10 minutes, it would stop, move back and capture another satellite. All the time downloading massive amounts of data because these are high resolution digital images. Every, every, every climate scientist, every, every agricultural scientist, every fishery scientist, sent, you say Sentinel, they, their eyes light up. This is one of their most important tools, right here, being downloaded. And just to give you a sense of how spectacular this location is, well, that's a, a shot of, of the same domes uh, against the Aurora Borealis. Oh, the Aurora Borealis, there's another space connection. Look at, all, look at all those photons coming from the sun, right? Impacted upon the ionosphere, which I've already mentioned. The aurora borealis is happening um, because the poles are where the Earth's magnetic field is, is the thinnest. And so we get these incredible displays above both the North and the South Poles. It's space. It's magnetism. It's energy coming off of a star, right? Um, so, so there again, uh, just a visual reminder of the connections. And, and here's one of those Sentinel satellites um, providing all this incredible imaging for all this incredible science. There it is, European Space Agency. It's a fantastically good story about the use of space, but there's a twist. The European Space Agency has been launching these incredible environmental satellites on old, repurposed Russian intercontinental ballistic missiles, SS-19s, because they're cheap. They exist. They were built in the 1980s, right? So why build new rockets that cost tens of millions of dollars when you can just use an old rocket that you have lying around? And, and the European Space Agency has been doing this to promote cooperation with Russia. And, and that's all fine, except for that orange smoke, which is what happens when you burn unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. Hydrazine, which is the propellant that was used in these ICBMs because it's stable. You can stick it in a missile, leave it for five years, and it works. You can't do that with a modern rocket. Modern rocket is, is, is usually kerosene and liquid oxygen. Um, could be hydrogen. In the future, could be methane. Uh, but those things are unstable. You need to load it up just before you launch. No. They were using UDMH. And that's the orange that you see. It's also the orange that you see coming from pictures out of North Korea when they launched their missiles, because they're using old technology too. Now, this wouldn't be particularly exciting except for that 18-year-old whose back you saw walking up our driveway, because um, in, in 2015, he identified that not only were the Russians launching these European satellites using these old rockets with this old fuel, but they're actually discarding the rocket stages in the Arctic. Uh, the first one actually is, the first drop zone is for the fairings, the cone on the top of the rocket. The second is, is for the first stage. And, and that third there is for the second stage that, that's coming down in the middle of nowhere between Baffin Island and Greenland. Hmm. The middle of nowhere. Well, if it's the middle of nowhere, what are, these, what are these communities doing around the middle of nowhere? There are people living there. And, and this, these second stages from these rockets are coming down relatively close to where these people live. These are Inuit communities. These are hunting communities. Why are all these people here? It's a long way north. Why would you want to live that far north? Oh, Maps are wonderful, aren't they? This is the Pikila Sorosuk, otherwise known as the North Water Polynya, the most biologically rich place in the entire Arctic. 
because it's open water throughout the year because of a remarkable combination of ocean currents and an ice bridge that forms across Nar Strait as ice is pushed down from the Arctic Ocean into that narrow choke point. And the prevailing winds and currents are moving southwards, the ice bridge forms, and, and you get this clear area. Now that's, that's clear open water. That's access to oxygen for all the marine mammals. Right? So the concentration of whales, of narwhal, of seals, uh, of polar bears is absolutely astonishing in this area. The richest biological area. That's why the people live here, because they're hunters. And that open water also means that there's a very early, very large plankton bloom. The ice is gone when the sun is at its maximum, the end of June. So this just turns into, the, the photosynthesis has gone wild. So concentrations of plankton, of mollusks, of Arctic cod, of seabirds, the, the single largest single species bird colony in the world is, is just over here on the Greenland side at, near Quanak. 60 million breeding pairs of little ox in one colony because of this open water. Oh, and that's where the Russians have been dropping their stages. So Cameron and I, Cameron and I actually broke the story. We ended up publishing an article about it, co-authored article in uh, the journal Polar Record, which is the journal of the Scott Polar Research Institute at the University of Cambridge. My kid got a peer-reviewed article published at the age of 16. Because it was his, right? Because he discovered it. But it's not the first time that we had space junk with toxic substances dropping on Canada. This, this was 19... Um, 1978, Cosmos 954, a nuclear-powered Russian spy satellite broke down and crashed through the atmosphere across the Northwest Territories. These are the search zones that were established as the Canadian government sought to clean this up. So it's happened before. We've had space junk. Incidentally, the Soviet Union reimbursed Canada for part of the cost of the cleanup in the 1970s. And, and across the Arctic to this day, we've got, we've got these things, which are um, radar stations. This is the northern, um, northern warning system, which is uh, the successor to the dew line stations, the distant early warning stations. This is at, at Hall Beach. Um, and it's tracking, or it would be tracking, any incoming intercontinental ballistic missiles, which incidentally, well, they go through space. That's why they're called ballistic, they're on ballistic trajectories. So the, the threat from, from Russia or, or China or North Korea actually comes through space, and the Arctic is one of the places where we surveil all that. But it's not all doom and gloom. There's a lot of cooperation that happens also. This picture is taken from 1967. Uh, this is the signing of the Outer Space Treaty. Um, a remarkable inst in instrument uh, negotiated uh, by the Soviet Union and the United States uh, and the United Kingdom, which was still a quasi-imperial power. Um, and it sets out a, a number of basic rules uh, for space, including a prohibition on the national appropriation of celestial bodies, a duty to rescue astronauts in distress, a principle of, of strict liability for damage caused by space objects. Hmm, important treaty, and one that has been followed very closely to this day. The ocean at the middle of the Arctic is governed by a not dissimilar instrument called the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Again, negotiated, concluded during the Cold War. A and working to this day, as I've mentioned, Russia is participating in the delineation of extended continental shelves using a procedure established by this treaty. So there is cooperation in both spheres, and part of my work that I'm going to be talking about in my next McLean lecture is about this international cooperation and my theories as to why this cooperation takes place in these cold, dark 
dangerous places. Cooperation is ongoing. This picture was taken uh, last year. Uh, the reason I include this picture is because uh, this astronaut here, uh, Serena Chancellor, is actually going to be at UBC in two months' time, um, speaking a, a, as part of a, an event organized by our new Outer Space Institute. Um, she uh, is the flight surgeon. Uh, and she specializes as a scientist in the effects of space on uh, human health. Uh, it's going to be awesome. But she's there with a, a Russian colleague and a, a German colleague. Because the International Space Station, well, it, it's international. And, and that cooperation is happening to this day. David Saint-Jacques, a Canadian, is on the International Space Station right now. So, you know, say what you want about tension between Russian, Russia and, and NATO. It, it's real, but it's not so real in cold, dark, dangerous places. Not so, not so, so much of a, an impediment to, to working together to, to get things done. Uh, and, and this, the ISS, for those of you who don't know, is an incredibly important laboratory because it's in microgravity. It's an incredibly valuable place for science. That's what this is. And uh, speaking of science, nice little rover, isn't it? NASA, Mars rover. Except it's not on Mars. It's on Devon Island in the Canadian Arctic because that's the Mars analog. And NASA tests all of its equipment in the Canadian Arctic. Um, so that, that little thing, um, uh, well, there's, you know, there are, we, we've launched quite a few rovers uh, to, to Mars, and yeah, they, they've all been, been not flight-proven, but, but, but Mars-proven in the Canadian Arctic. Conditions are not dissimilar. Another connection between the Arctic and space. And, and when we go to Mars as a species, when we actually start to live on Mars, all of this Arctic stuff will become relevant in a new way. This is from the SpaceX website. This is Elon Musk and his team projecting what a Mars colony might look like. Now, these are BFRs, big friggin' rockets. Um, <laughs> um, and, 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 and yes, they're, they're hypothesizing, but these guys actually land rockets, right? Um, and, and they've been testing their, their methane engine, the Raptor, for these things, and they've got a prototype that's actually in Texas of one of these rockets now. Okay, so maybe it's not so distant. Now, look at that, look at that habitation. Look at all those, those domes. Look at, in the shadow of those mountains, you've got, you've got people living in a cold, dark, dangerous place, relying on high technology. Gosh, it's so futuristic. or not. If we're going to Mars, we're going to have to learn from the Inuit. We're going to have to learn about a whole bunch of things, including how to not kill each other living in small domes that you cannot leave ever, right? Or at least for many months at a time. We have to learn why there's no word in Anuktitut for anger because you can't afford to ever be angry in these kinds of conditions. That will apply on Mars. One of the biggest challenges of space travel is psychological. We're going to learn how to adapt, how to discover new forms of transportation. Look at the kayak. Is that really all that different from a, a big friggin' rocket? Well, yes and, and no. Um, the point here is that the Arctic actually is a perfect analog for space. And there are differences. Of course there are differences. There are no indigenous people living in space, as far as we know. Right? There are differences. You can breathe the air in the Arctic. You can't do that on Mars. There are differences. But the similarities, my gosh, they're astounding. And not only do you have that comparison, 
what it adds to our understanding of a place like the Arctic, when all of a sudden you're not looking at it in, in 2D or, or just in terms of the oceans or the topography on land, but when you're seeing it in its entirety, going all the way from, from the seabed out to the distant stars. The, the Arctic is, is most definitely 3D, and again, it's much, much deeper than it is broad. I don't know how much time we have for questions, but I'd love to take a few, and that's my first lecture. Thank you very much. What do you think, Mark? Can we take a few questions? Michelle, can we take a few questions? Okay, Michelle's already asked me to direct traffic. Yes, please. Excellent. Yes, you can go.